Often titled the father of comedy, Aristophanes is the oldest surviving comedic playwright. As profound as vulgar, his plays reveal ancient Athenian values, ideology, and controversies. Jeering at and referencing sex, gender, religion, politicians, history, other playwrights, and morality, he is now, perhaps, even more irreverent and funny than ever before. Frogs The play begins with a joke about how the play should begin with a joke. Attempting to make such a joke, Xanthias, a servant, repeatedly steals the punchline that Dionysus, the god, wishes to arrive at. Then there is an all-too-famous joke Dionysus complains of how he, the god, is walking whereas the servant is comfortably riding on a donkey. Xanthias argues that he has the shore of carrying some bags. Dionysus replies that it is the donkey who is doing the carrying and Xanthias, though he is being carried by the donkey, maintains that the donkey is not carrying the bags that he is carrying. Thus, Dionysus suggests that Xanthias should carry the donkey and let the donkey carry the bags. They arrive at the house of Heracles or Hercules. They need his advice or counsel because he has been to the underworld. He defeated Cerberus, the three-headed giant dog, that guards the entrance and, well, they need him to tell them how to get there and get past all the obstacles. Dionysus wishes to get to the underworld to recall a lost dramatist playwriter given as all the new ones are not meeting his needs. In the realm of Hades or Pluto, he hopes to retrieve either Euripides or Aeschylus. Unfortunately, Sophocles only died when the play was already being produced, and so Aristophanes only manages to include some mentions of him. Heracles suggests various currently alive dramatists such as Pythangelus, Agathon, and Iophon, the son of Sophocles. The works of these authors are currently lost to humanity. Needless to mention, Dionysus is not satisfied with them. Dionysus disguises himself as Hercules in the hopes that that will help him in his upcoming trials. As for how to get there, Heracles first suggests suicide as a joke, but then tells them the way. You'll be ferried across by an ancient tar in a tiny bag the size of this, no bigger. Two oboes is the fair. After that, you come to an arena horribly alive with snakes and beasts, really beastly. Don't try to scare me off. You won't succeed. You'll run into a mass of mud and a river of excreta in which you'll see quite a lot of people flounder. Those who wronged a stranger, those who screwed a comely lad out of his feet or lashed out at his mother, or sucked his father in the jaw, or anyone who was a perjurer or copied out a speech by Mosimus. And you should put on the list, too, anyone who has learned that stupid war dance by Synesius. To understand the prior joke, let me explain that both Morsimus and Synesius were New Age poets and musicians. The former is frequently mocked as having no real talent. The latter led the effort of changing music into a style that, according to some, lacked substance and disguised it through out-of-place sound ornaments. Alas, true knowledge of these things is utterly lost to us. We can only imagine. In the end, Dionysus sees a procession of mourners carrying a corpse. They approach and ask the corpse if they can hitch a ride with him. The corpse charges them a fee, and soon enough they meet with Sharon, the creature that ferried souls to the gates of Hades for a fee. A joke is made wherein the fairy man will not take slaves unless they fought at Arginusi. This was a naval battle wherein many recently freed slaves fought on behalf of the democracy. The point is that only Dionysus gets on the boat and Xanthias has to take the long way around by himself. Of course, whoever said that there was a long way around at all? As he is ferried across the river, a chorus of frogs swims and sings alongside the raft. They make the noise frogs make, which annoys Dionysus, it is really cute to imagine. Also, they sing of the value of tradition, and they praise themselves so the music that accompanied the song must have been traditional. When he arrives on the shore, he finds Xanthias. Apparently, there are some scary creatures that Heracles warned them about. Dionysus approaches the audience and begs help from the priest of Dionysus, who was customarily given a front row seat. Then they meet with various characters, there is a feast, Dionysus passes as Heracles because of his costume. Yet, this nearly gets him into trouble. Icus, 
One of the guards of judges at the entrance to the underworld is angry at Hercules, and he thinks that Dionysus is Hercules. Fearing a confrontation, the god of wine faints, and the following joke ensues. But I feel faint. Do get me a sponge for my, my heart. Here, use it. Golden gods of Olympus. Is that where you keep your heart? Can't help it, it got a fright. Meaning, the god shot his pants. Xanthias makes fun of him and so Dionysus has him dress up like Hercules. Now another character comes in. This one is actually glad to see Heracles and invites them to a meal and offers the slave the service of some very beautiful dancing girls. Dionysus outraged says the following. Hold on a moment. You can't take our game of dressing you up as the master literally? Now look here, Xanthias. Pick up our stuff and stop acting daft. Really? So, all that talk about needing my help was just a game? I don't joke around. Do as I say. Take that lion skin off. Witnesses, this man is stealing from me. I appeal to the gods. You call on divinity, how theologically illiterate, and how presumptuous of you to imagine that you could be Alcmene's son. Xanthias is mad at Dionysus, but then new characters come in who threaten Xanthias. Xanthias swears he has never done them any harm and that they are making a mistake. He offers his servant, Dionysus, to be tortured as he will attest to the truth. Dionysus tells them not to bother trying to harm him as he is an immortal god who cannot feel any pain. Long story made short, Iacus, the character who holds them captive, agrees to flog them both to see which, if any, is truly a god. They are both comically able to resist the blows, always shouting something in reaction to the pain which they pretend as the purposeful beginning of a line from theater or poetry. For example, Apollo, who lives on Delos or perhaps at Pytho, what's the big deal? A line of Hipponax was in my mind. You're getting nowhere. Wallop him one right in the ribs. Iacus, frustrated, decides to take them to Pluto and Persephone, the king and queen of the underworld. The chorus advises the audience on how the Athenians may avoid so many political mistakes. This play occurs at a low point in the Peloponnesian War. Defeat is inevitable, and what Aristophanes says is rather inconsequential as he does not provide any specifics, makes a conservative criticism about the slaves that were granted citizenship, and then he seemingly takes the criticism back. I did not like it. It turns out that Pluto is trying to host a competition between the souls of Euripides and Aeschylus to see who is, or was, the better playwright. There are several jokes on how the gods will use instruments of measure to weight and analyze the worth of each writer's poetry and thoughts. Pluto is glad to see Dionysus as this is supposed to be his expertise, and thus, he makes him the official arbiter. Dionysus tells him about how he would like to take the winner back into the world of the living and Hades agrees. The two dramatists insult each other, and then Euripides says of Aeschylus. His prologues always begin with some solitary soul, an Achilles, say, or a Niobe, all muffled up so you can't see their faces and not uttering a syllable. Quite a travesty, I'd say, of dramatic tragedy. Yes, you've got it exactly. Then after his bumbled along like this till the play is almost done, is followed by a whole string of scarecrow weirdies designed to make your flesh crawl. It's all river salamanders, fosses and bronze-bossed bucklers emblazoned with eagle griffins and great rough-hewn decorations for which there are never any explanations. Yeah, that is right. I've lain awake all through the long leviathan of the night, trying to tell what is meant by a swooping hippocockerel. It's the figurehead painted on our ships at Troy, you cretin. There is so much I would like to quote, but let me merely mention that Euripides argues that his plays have made the Athenians smarter. By the way, it is estimated that the literacy levels of the ancient Athenians must have been unrivaled until the later part of the 20th century. The fact that they voted this very play first prize is, perhaps, proof of it. As to Euripides' comments Dionysus says, By the gods you're right, when an Athenian comes home now he starts to bawl the servants out. Whereas before Euripides they simply sat like gawking dummies half alive. 
Aeschylus begins his response by arguing that the duty of the artist is to improve the moral and civil qualities, such as honor, honesty, and courage of the ordinary people. This, he claims, is exactly what he has done and what exactly Euripides has failed to do. On this subject, Aeschylus mentions the following. This is the sort of thing that poets should celebrate, and this, you may remember, is what one finds among the best of poets from earliest times. At one or several occasions, either Dionysus or the Chorus, refers to Aeschylus as the Achilles of the arts, so yeah. At one point, Aeschylus mentions how Euripides' wife apparently cheated on him, I guess this had become public knowledge, and Dionysus laughs commenting that he suffered what he so often depicted in his own plays. Consider the following line by Aeschylus. Children may have teachers, but adults have the poet and the poet ought to keep things on a higher plane. I will venture, hopefully, to modify the sentence and make it into a more manageable and portable aphorism. On this subject, the following noteworthy exchange occurs. My word! Can't you do your teaching in the language of men? Listen, you miserable heel, the lofty thought and the high ideal call for a language to match, this is where I blazed a trail, which you've managed to undermine. Then Euripides begins to systematically criticize Aeschylus' prologues. The comments are too deep, yet silly, to bother fully divulging. One of them hinges on the different interpretations arising from the use of repetition, but is all inconsequential. Then Aeschylus criticizes Euripides' prologues. The older dramatist says that the younger is overly repetitive and concerned with the mundane, with the everyday. I don't know about the repetitiveness, but indeed Aeschylus' drama, much as the old comedy of Aristophanes, was concerned with grand events. In this case, drama between the gods. Euripides, on the other hand, included the gods, but the drama is more down-to-earth, more directly similar to what may actually afflict a real person. Aeschylus also calls fourth Euripides' muse, a near-naked dancing girl, and uses her to parody several of his passages. To fully get the parody, one must be familiar with Euripides' plays and writings. However, as only a relatively small portion of their total work survives, many of the jokes seem a bit incomprehensible to a modern reader. When this ends, they decide to literally measure their art as they step on top of either side of a large scale and begin, waiting, whose lines are better. Aeschylus wins, for silly reasons, I guess. Yet, Dionysus still takes the chance to ask them how they would help the Athenians if he brought them back to life. He specifically asks them about Alcibiades, accordingly, this is after the man has already been kicked out for a second time. He tells them that the Athenians love him and hate him. Aeschylus answers. It's not a good idea in a town to rear a lion cub, but if you do, make sure he's happy when he grows up and not liable to run amok. To counteract this analogy Euripides bestows some near aphorisms. If we put faith in the faithful and stopped having faith in the faithless. If we stopped trusting the citizens we're trusting and began to trust the citizens we don't. Well, we're getting nowhere with the present lot, so at least we might have a chance with their opposite. This recommendation seems to be exactly the theme and joke of Aristophanes' next play. Dionysus chooses Aeschylus. At that time, Aeschylus was unquestionably the more popular. However, opinions would later change. I hope you enjoyed learning about frogs, as usual. To entice you into watching the completion of this series, I gift you an aphorism I came up as I read this play. You may only claim to be an artist if you seek to guide adults as parents guide children. If you enjoy or gain from my aphorisms, know that I have thousands. I will be writing books with short thematic essays composed out of aphorisms. These essays are profound and intriguing yet easy to read. For very cheap copies, look up Protagoras Pause in the Amazon website. I repeat, Protagoras Pause, that's my name.